Greetings, folks. Uh, John Abendroth here and uh, honored to have one of the uh, really key people in golf at this point in, uh, in our golfing lives join me today, Dave Stockton. Uh, good morning, Dave, and I'll, uh, I'll do a proper introduction, but uh, thanks so much for uh, having a little bit of time as we record. You're packing your bags to uh, head off to the PGA in, uh, in Tulsa. Well, yeah, thank you, John. It's good to be with you always and uh, looking forward to talking to you today. Yeah, cool. And uh, let's let's do it properly here. Uh, Two-time PGA champion, and one of those was at Tulsa. Uh, uh, the other at Congressional. Uh, 1991 captain of the Ryder Cup team. Uh, Ten PGA Tour wins, uh, and and one that probably a lot of people maybe don't remember, but you do. The 1996 Senior U.S. Open. So, um, you know, you got three majors under your belt and uh, maybe we ought to start a little uh, project to get you in the World Golf Hall of Fame. Well, you need to add two more because I won two senior players as well. There you go. Yep, five, five more than three, but they basically just count off the regular tours. So I, I was appreciative that Nicholas and a few others let me win a couple of them anyway. Yeah, no, that, that's great. You know, you played in, you know, at my age, I call it the golden era and you know, uh, the transition of, you know, players like, you know, Sneed was playing, obviously, when you were, and then, you know, the transition of all these great players like the Watsons and the Trevinos and yourself, and, uh, you know, just really a, a golden time, um, and be curious to see who the next, you know, one that carries the torch comes through here. Well, I'm, I'm not so sure it's one at the rate they're going. Uh, you know, we had Spieth come up really good and McElroy came up really good. And, you know, a bunch of them have come up and you think, OK, they're going to stick for a while. Dustin Johnson, uh, Kepka. I mean, there's a bunch of them. It, it's it's kind of like when Tiger slowed down there and he opened the door for a lot of them to, to have an opportunity to get a major and then get multiple majors. Uh, and I think that's the strength of the of the the regular tour now uh, on the men's side, it's just, it's so compacted by a bunch of guys that can play it. it every week you have a hard time figuring out who's going to come out on top. And it, for your era, Marikawa coming right out from up there, what he's done, what a fantastic young player he is. Yeah. Really, really amazing. I heard a story recently that when he was recruited to Cal, they said, uh, well, here's how we do this. You'll redshirt the first year. And he goes, no, 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 wait a minute. I'm not going to redshirt. I'm ready. And, and so, right. you know, that confidence was was really something there. Yeah. I, see, I don't know how Cal's done it, because when I came up there, when I was at SC and played against Cal and we played Arinda, I'd never played off mats before. <laughs> so now I look at all the series of great teams Cal's, you know, put out and the number of great players that have come out of the program. Uh, it's it's fantastic to see because, you know, I go back to, you know, Jim Langley was ahead of me a little bit, but uh yeah, he was, you know, being as tall as he was, he wasn't a prototypical Cal guy because most of them seem to be fairly short. But uh, it, it is really great to see the the depth, you know, Stanford with Woods and all the rest of them. They've had a great program, too. But your Northern Cal programs are really shining of late. Yeah. And the women, you know, San Jose State right now is is ranked very, very high and, you know, really a huge amount of tradition and, and quality golf there. Let's talk a little more about the PGA coming up. What do you feel has happened with the date change that was started with the Olympics being added back to golf? Now, the PGA is the second one of the the open or the major schedule. Do you think that's elevated the status of the PGA championship? I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, they had to do it now with they have the playoffs and all the stuff. I mean, they had to get finished in August because you had to finish up before the Ryder Cup and President's Cup. This year will be a President's Cup. Um, I, I think the one thing, thinking back to my winning my first major there at Southern Hills in 1970, uh, I mean, it was 100 degrees and 95 to 100 percent humidity. Uh, the one thing I think about is they're going to have a, from the weather standpoint, it's supposed to not get out of the 80s. And so it should be a, not a fair test, obviously, from the weather point of view, because it, I remember Venturi winning the Open at Congressional where I won the second PGA. I mean, when he won there in 64 and, and to have to play 36 holes at that time of year was just unbelievable. So 
basically, then that was an open, but played, you know, I'm sorry, it wouldn't have been in August. It would have been in June, but it, it was tremendously hot weather. I, I think it's going to be a fair test of golf. The other side of the coin is that I'm looking forward to getting there and seeing what Gil Hans has done to Southern Hills. I saw it last year in the PGA Seniors. Uh, I saw a lot less trees and I saw a lot more bunkers, but it still had the great layout. It's, what I liked about it, John, is the golf course doesn't favor a drawer of the ball or a fader of the ball. You've got to work the ball both ways. And it's going to be a very stern test of golf, but weather-wise, I think it'll be an enjoyable walk this time instead of, you know, for me, of course, I was out there with Arnold Palmer and it, like I said, it was tremendously hot. And uh, that was the most difficult factor along with playing such a hard golf course. Right. Let's get outside the ropes a little bit for the PGA. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, there could be some real fireworks and uh, <clears throat> quite a circus with everything that's gone on with Greg Norman with the LIV tour, uh, Phil Mickelson, the defending champion. Uh, mm -hmm. As we record this, it's the uh, just a, a, a number of days before the PGA championship. And uh what, what are a couple of basic feelings that you have on what uh, what could be happening there? Well, first I'll go back to ancient <clears throat> history and the, the big three, which should have been the big four, putting Casper on in with Palmer and Player and Nicholas. But at that time, uh, we hadn't broken away from the PGA, the PGA of America and started the PGA Tour. And if the big three or four wanted to have their own tour exhibition type thing, they could have controlled golf. There would be no question about it. Uh, but they believed in the game. They believed in our our tournaments, our four majors that we play on the regular tour. Uh, and it, it should have been supported. Well, you know, Arnold and Jack basically remade the British Open. I mean, they call it the Open because it's the oldest, you know, major we can test. But they made it possible for people to go over there and play. And that's one reason when now that the British Open is now the last in the rotation, probably elevates its status from sitting in the middle. But uh, I just, I feel that um, it, it's really an interesting year this year because I, I don't back Greg Norman. Greg Norman is doing what Arnold and Jack and Gary could have done in the 60s and what killed us. And I'm, I'm interested to see what's happened. I hope the, that when they don't, they didn't grant these guys an opportunity to go play over there and, you know, obviously the first ones I think in London or something, and then they have four over here. Uh, we can't afford to have that. Uh, I don't see where there's room for another big tour. I don't think you need an exhibition style. Okay, you get here, you're at the end of your career. I guess Westwood's one of them in it. Uh, I, you know, I, maybe they need the money. I don't know, but it, but I think for the prestige of winning these majors, um, they're, they're going to be very foolish if they get blackballed off this and not be able to play. You mentioned Mickelson. Uh, be curious to see if he plays. I'm excited. I know Tiger will, I'm pretty sure, you know, 95% because he did so well in the Masters, at least I thought. Yep. And uh, But Mickelson, I don't know. Uh, I was surprised that he didn't go to the Masters being a three-time winner. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe he's been suspended and we don't know. But then he enters the PGA, and if he shows up, I guess he wasn't. Uh, but there's, there's going to be some, he should not be the, the, he's the defending champion. And so it's too bad that he's got the, all this press has come up regarding the Saudis league with Greg Norman in it. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I just think it's a total distraction from what's going to be the fifth time the PGA has been played at Southern Hills. Um, and it's going to be, it's going to be sad if it, if it any way becomes a story about Phil Mickelson it should be about Southern Hills and the great, great PGA contest we're going to see. Yeah, exactly. When we spoke this week, uh, I think you mentioned that there's been a change in the uh, the champions dinner, and I think you even said champion and captains dinner uh, at the PGA. That that's got to be just a tremendous uh, honor and function for you to attend uh, at the PGA as you will next week. Well, it is now. I think. People don't realize, I think all of us wanted to win a Masters. Uh, George Archer could have told us that. I mean, it'd be fun to, we could record him right now. And <laughs> what he was sitting on that Tuesday night at a, a past uh, Champions Dinner at the Masters, the only person in that room that's not a player is the, the who's ever the head, uh, whether it was Clifford Roberts or whoever it might be as it comes through history. Uh, 
And so you have all these players and the stories they would tell. I mean, I could just picture sitting in there and listen to Hogan and Sneed and Byron Nelson and Walter Hagen and all these different people that, that get up and spoke in that room. Uh, it was special. And the PGA got away from that. The U.S. Open doesn't have a dinner. I mean, they, there's nothing, I don't think. But as far as the PGA, we went from having a small intimate outing of, among the a dinner among the winners and our wives were in a different room to all of a sudden became a gala where you had, well, three years ago, Davis and Love and I are on the same table. We're about 15 people apart. And the 15 people between Davis, Love and I, I had no idea who any of them were. Mm. I mean, it was like a cocktail party and you couldn't wait to get out of there. And last year at, at Kiowa, um, Murakawa is a defending champion and we come into the room and it's there's like three PGA officers and that was it. And the rest are all people, all champions of the PGA that are sitting there. And we talked and we finished the dinner and it was surprising. And I think it shocked the PGA that hardly any of us left. We just stood around talking, telling stories. And that to me is what I'm looking for. That's why primarily I'm going to Southern Hills other than I want to see the new rotation. But I want to sit in that room and I want to hear some of the younger guys now tell the story because the shoes on the other foot. I'm one of the older guys. And they probably can't even relate to me. Well, if the Morikawa's of the world, and I'm sure he is as smart, they'd have a, a, a notepad out when Dave Stockton speaks. So, uh, you know, that's <clears throat> important, important stuff. Talk a little bit about Stockton golf and what you're doing with your boys and uh, some of the instruction things that are happening. Well, the key, you just said the key word happening. Uh, COVID was not good. Obviously, you couldn't get together and meet very much. Uh, Stockton Golf, per se, right now, Ronnie lives in Redlands right here where I do. And we do a lot of individual teaching. Uh, I'm not teaching anybody right now, per se. There's a couple, but uh, that I'm teaching anybody on tour. The days are gone when I was out there a whole bunch. Uh, David has left Carlsbad, California. He's moved to Scottsdale, Arizona, and he still do. We still do all the corporate stuff together when they come up, but he's selling real estate at Desert Mountain, and he's also gone up to uh, to uh, uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Coeur d'Alene, saw that online, Coeur yeah. Yeah, Coeur d'Alene, and he's, it's a really interesting. It the, it's a, was a public course that Weisskopf built. It's now private. And it's uh, CDA Reserve National, and he's going to be teaching up there, uh, running a lot of the golf, and and also selling real estate. So he's he's between Coeur d'Alene and Scottsdale, Arizona. So I'm not going to worry about him too much. I think he and Diana, and the grandkids, are going to be doing really well. And uh, so it's it, it's starting to pop. I mean, we're starting to go different places. I mean, we did our uh, the master. All three of us were together and everything, mm -hmm. doing our corporate stuff. Uh, so it, it, I'm trying to keep myself busy doing that. And we, you know, I played in Houston, the, uh, celebrity part and on that Saturday where, you know, Annika joined, uh, Gary Player and Trevino and Jack Nicholas, who, who beat our group, uh, Hale Irwin, Larry Nelson and myself and played with Laura Davies, which I had not done before. Uh, and it almost drove me to retirement. I'd hit a seven iron, she'd hit a pitching wedge. <laughs> It's one thing to have the guys out blow it by you by 50, but boy, she could kill it. So it was fun to get out. It's just fun to be out. And uh, Kathy and I are really looking forward to being here in Tulsa this coming week. Talk about uh, what you call the signature method. Um, I've learned an awful lot from that in being at your clinics at the George Archer Foundation Tournament. And what I feel for the average golfer, that's such an awesome theory if you when you buy into it because – it, it helps for those people that aren't going to spend 30 hours a week uh, working on their game. Well, no, thanks, John. I mean, the, the signature approach, basically, uh, both Ronnie and David, Ronnie primarily, we talked about it. And when you give a lesson, the first thing you ask somebody to do is sign their name, sign like they're signing a check or something. And then right below, then take them three or four seconds. Then right below it, tell them to take 20 and try to duplicate their own signature. Basically, trying hard, picturing what they're doing, and really working to get it perfect. They got no chance. They can't get past the first letter in their name. And what that means is that trying necessarily doesn't do it for you when you're when you're trying to be a good putter. You kind of have to let it flow because when we talk to them, I want the I want the putting signature 
and you when you have your you're making your stroke i want it to be like your first i want you to just let it go i don't want you to be thinking about it but the average golfer tends to do things that are bizarre i mean if if you're a good pool player or if you can throw darts or anything like this i think you can be a good putter without any trouble because it's hand eye coordination but just a really quick simple deal is that golfers now the big thing is lining up the ball putting a line on the ball, which is wonderful if you know where in the hell to line it up. Yeah. And most people have no clue, but they line it up and then they come walking in and then they take their practice strokes. And then they put the putter behind the ball. All of this is taking time. And while they're putting the putter behind the ball and taking practice strokes, very few of them look at the hole. But now they got the putter down, they set their feet. Now they look at the hole the first time and generally it's not where they expected it to be, but they're, they're trying to get this putting stroke gone or they waste too much time and it's, they don't feel comfortable. In reality, when somebody shoots pool, you're not gonna take practice strokes beside the cue ball, you're gonna set up behind it. And then the other thing somebody shooting pool doesn't do is they don't just hold it there and then ram the ball, they have it going back and forth. Someone like a fly fisherman that would be casting and you take the, take it back, go forward, take it back and let it, let it go. Well, if they do that, it's gonna be in rhythm. Picture the average person, just you just mentioned, that doesn't practice that much, and they stick the putter down on the ground. Now they go through the last five things they've been told to do, and that putter's on that ground for five to 10 seconds without moving. And when it starts, it will not be smooth. And so it's just, to me, I always try to relate, and both boys also try to relate to other sports, so they kind of clicks on in their head, well, why would I why would I take all these practice strokes? Now, somebody, John, some people have to do, like Annika, I tried to get her to stop taking practice strokes because she's left brain and she's very mechanical. And finally, she came back and we agreed, okay, you can take the practice strokes, but it has to be behind the ball, facing the ball in front of you, and then looking at the hole ahead of you there, not coming up to the ball because you can take, I told her, take 10 practice strokes, but when you walk to that ball, I want you to get up there and let it go. And she went from 18 months of winning two tournaments, she won 18 times the next 18 months. I mean, it was night and day. And people just don't realize how this trying and really tying themselves up into knots rather than looking at the hole. I mean, my whole thought process is to the picture where it's gonna fall in, up to right to left, it may come in at five o'clock or four o'clock on a clock, straight dead straight would be six o'clock. And I come back to the ball and I pick a spot one inch in front of the ball and my eyes, I'm not even looking at the ball. I'm looking at that one inch because my dad, the, probably the best lesson I ever got. He said, I want you to give me one inch by the putter going, touching the ball and going through with your stroke. I want you to give me one inch without any movement of that putter being affected by touching the ball. In other words, just go right on through it. And most people recoil. Most people look up and stand up a bit lift the putter higher than they need to, and the ball's gonna bounce all over the place. It's, it's not rocket science, but people try to make it like it is. Yeah, you know, the one I love is Davis Love, his pre-shot, he, he makes what I call an authentic practice stroke, a rehearsal, as I like to say, a moment of thought, and then boom, there it goes. And I think that's a, a good way to go. So Stockton Golf is the, uh, the place to go if people want to uh, get a lesson with one of the Stockton clan. Yes, yes. And and we're, we're all available. Uh, we're doing more corporate and we're filling up with, with scheduling. I think I just did something in Rancho Las Palmas this week and uh, it, it's, it's starting to really boom. People are glad to be getting out and there's still a lot of people that need help with their short game and we're ready to help them. Yeah, great. Last topic for Dave Stockton, uh, PJ champion about to uh, head off to Tulsa. Talk a little bit about the George Archer Foundation that you and I are both involved with and uh, and all the help that uh, Donna is getting for the kids who have issues with reading. I think George would be very proud of uh, of, of you and Donna for being the uh, the real the real troopers on this deal. Well, none of us until the Vogue article had any clue that George couldn't couldn't write and read and basically pass a third grade level. I mean, had no clue and, and didn't pick up on it when he would, they would give him a script to read and he'd say, oh, I'd rather do this extemporaneously. We had no clue. So after the article came out, after George had passed away, I reached out to Donna because number one, I thought of literacy and what a, what a great cause. And she's, you know, 
you know, it just she she wanted it to be known, and George was agree okay with it to to let her after he was gone to to let the public know what what a battle he fought and what, what a great person on to put this together with her whole family. Uh, and the Peninsula Club up there, they do such an awesome job of holding, and I think it's the middle of October. I don't have it right in front of me, but I'm yeah. looking forward to getting back up there. But uh, it's it's such a great cause, and and um, we haven't come close to to touching what we need to touch. And um, so you, as you and I, well, no, we both sit on the board. So I mean, it it's fun to been a part of it. Uh, and as long as they keep asking me back, I'll come back up because it's just. And George was, should be very proud. He has a he had a wonderful wife and and Donna. They made an unbelievable team, and uh, we obviously miss him. It's kind of you've lost two great ones up there. I remember when Lima was killed, leaving Firestone, just when I was getting started in '66, just getting started on the on the tour and everything. And uh, I don't know why the good ones have to leave us before they should. It's sad. Yeah, and you know, coming up as a San Francisco junior golfer, high school golfer, and you know, we we all looked up to Lima and Archer because we would see them out and about, and you know, just just you know, those are really touching thoughts on your part. But uh, you know, great great inspirations to to many of us. Dave, thank you so much for uh, valuable time this morning. Have a wonderful time at Tulsa, and uh, uh, look forward to a great championship. And I'm sure there'll be a great champion come out of it. Yeah, I, I, I expect so too, John. It's great to be with you. Go catch a big fish for me, okay? I'll send you a picture. I, I learned a lesson by uh, a couple of years ago. I showed you a picture of a, a salmon I caught. And you said, no, no, wait a minute. This is what a real salmon looks like. And uh, <laughs> I, I learned a lesson there. We'll, uh, we'll just talk about it from now on. We won't show pictures. Okay, you got it. That's all right. All right. Thank you so much. Take care, my friend. Good being with you. All right.